we started our business uh, and eventually got into the, the fitness space, uh, this would have been just as we were finishing, and I, when I say we, uh, my partner Scott Watterson and I, just as we were graduating from uh, school here. I was a student here from 19, uh, uh, graduated in 1979, started the business in 1977, okay, and, and we happened to go into a business that uh, was kind of on the cusp of a lot of growth, an industry that was on the cusp of a lot of growth. At the time, the fitness business was, uh, was probably a three or four hundred million dollar category, okay, in the United States. Today, it's nearly five billion dollars, all right? And so, the market dynamics for us allowed us to grow in a way where we didn't have to go in and try to pound market share out of someone else. We had to do that in some cases, but when, you have, when, you, when, when you're in, into an industry, you entrepreneurs, as, as you evaluate the space that you want to be in, evaluate whether you're going into a place where there's you know, enough space for you to be able to achieve the goals that you want to achieve, number one, and you've got a growth dynamic so that you can grow with the industry rather than just having to go in and try to take share from somebody else uh, when margins are compressed and things are tough. Now let me just identify some of the dynamics and we study this every day uh, and, it, and it helps us make decisions every single day the dynamics that we're dealing with in the marketplace today. One, the aging baby boomer. Okay. And uh, they're, they're all beginning to turn 60 now, okay? And you've heard, the, you, you maybe have heard the adage, 60 is 40. The baby boomers that are turning 60 really are not doing that willingly. And one of the dynamics of these people is, I don't want to be old, I don't, don't want to be viewed as old, and I don't want to feel old. And so they have fueled this industry for, for many years, but they continue to fuel, to fuel it right now. Uh, and, and part of that is their spending power, their, their willingness to spend uh, on consumer products, and their desire to maintain their health so that they can maintain an active lifestyle. Now, a dynamic that's beginning to unfold for us right now that we really haven't enjoyed is the, the consumer interest in this category that's going across many different age demographics, okay? Including Gen Xers, Gen Ys, okay? Even children now, or parents for their children, and, uh, and seniors also. And so as we think about this, it drives the way that we develop products and the type of products that we're putting into the marketplace and the channels that we're placing those products in the marketplace. Here's something that is driving our business. I love to walk into a meeting and see people that need to exercise, okay? To see expanding waistlines because that's our market for us next year and the year after. And indeed, this, this uh, phenomena that we have and our culture of New Year's resolutions means that our category, unlike most consumer products whose best-selling months are November and December, preparatory to, to the holiday season, our product category's strongest selling season is in January and February, and then December, and then March, and then November. Okay? In fact, they say the average weight of an adult in the United States increases seven pounds from Thanksgiving weekend to, to New Year's weekend, okay? And so we have, I, I, I'd hate to even add up how much weight that is, uh, but that's a dynamic for us. And so that drives the way we market our products and the time of year and the promotions and the way that we uh, work with our, with our customer base. Uh, you can see right here that it, we have a crisis worldwide. Uh, those dark red uh, states are the states where you have uh, over 30% of the population is obese. 
okay? Uh, they like uh, home cooking down there in Louisiana, Mississippi is what it looks like to me. But, but there is an absolute crisis uh, that is going on around the world and our company, as well as many others that you see advertising on TV, are benefiting from that, from that crisis. You know, the, the food business today is, is dramatically different than it was 10 years ago as a result of these dynamics uh, that are demographic and psychographic based. Some of our best endorsers now are physicians. And most of you uh, at some point will go have a physical and even uh, 20-somethings when they're going in and having physicals now in many cases are going in and the observation is being made you're overweight you need to have a more active lifestyle okay absolutely the 40 and the 50 and the 60 somethings hear this nearly universally okay and 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 the latest uh, uh, word is exercise is medicine the Surgeon General has come out he's indicated that that obesity is the leading cause of death in the United States as it exceeds uh, lung cancer or tobacco-based diseases, okay? Another dynamic that we're dealing with. Now let's just look at, the, at now how that rolls into the category, the space that we play in, okay? Uh, and, and this is not intuitive to many people uh, where fitness stands overall. I'd just like to show you some of the uh, things that are taking place uh, in the United States right now in terms of uh, participation in uh, sports. There's a lot of reasons this might be happening, but look at that. Counterintuitive to a lot of people. All of those sports are now experiencing declining, decreasing participation. Some of these things that you love to do. Uh, and, and there's many phenomena and dynamic that cause uh, soccer and football and baseball. You know, you've got, you've got youth sports leagues that are focusing on year-round sports. They won't let uh, children participate in multiple sports. How many three-sport high school athletes are there anymore? There's not very many anymore. Uh, and they're getting pushed when they're at a young age to choose their sport and stay with that. Now, when they do that, that has a negative impact on the sports that they would have been participating in. Okay? And so we have these declining participation rates everywhere, but in the fitness active space, because these tend to drive different age demographic, one, and they go across all sports categories. Okay? And so what does that do? That means that in the United States, you could add together, basketball, snowboarding, football, soccer, hunting, uh, wheel sport, all of those together do not equal the number of uh, sales dollars uh, each year that are done in the fitness space. Okay? So when you walk into a sporting goods store and you see the way the floor is allocated, okay, you might begin to get a hint as to, as to how they're uh, seeing the business rolling out. And then you see the, the support in uh, footwear and apparel. They have to keep a presence in some of these smaller areas or they're not viewed as a credible sporting goods outlet. But the real dollars are driving in these activewear areas. That's why as a company right now we are, if you, if you go out to most of the sporting goods retailers in the United States, a sports authority or a Dix or a uh, MC Sports or a, a, the, the large sporting goods chains. Uh, we as a company are usually the second, third, or fourth largest vendor uh, for that company. It always starts with Nike and then it's usually Adidas and then you've got Under Armour who's made a huge uh, uh, surge uh, and usually then uh, Icon is, uh, is one of the top vendors in this sporting goods area. Why is that? Well, it's just a function of uh, participation rates. So as you become a student of whatever industry that you go into, okay, these are the drivers that are going to teach you 
where your focus should be, where your emphasis should be. You know, uh, Scott and I have often said when we started our business, we didn't, we didn't think about this being a $300 million category and, and maybe that it would go to $5 billion. But as we think today about the time and the effort and the energy that we've placed uh, in this space, sometimes we say, what if we would have put that effort in footwear? You know, that's a $17 billion space or, or a $21 billion space. What if we would have put it in some of the technology areas, you know, where they've got, where, where you're talking about an industry that's a 25 or $30 billion industry, okay? These would be things for you to think about if you're thinking about a, a place that you're going to be. What does the long-term prospect look like, okay? Where is the product category going to go, okay? You're seeing right now the music industry changing dramatically, okay? Uh, media changing dramatically. It's got newspapers. It's got uh, producers of uh, uh, DVDs and CDs in, uh, and retailers of such in incredible turmoil right now. You have Best Buy uh, uh, that are trying to figure out what they're going to do to replace in their footprint the high cost the sales per square foot that they get in, uh, in traditionally they've had in DVDs and CDs, okay? And, the, and if you look five years from now, where is that going to be? You know, this is, the, this is the generation that's changing that. You know, where will that be? How many of those hard things are they going to sell? And how do they take, how do they participate in the online phenomena? What do they do to change themselves? And think about, you know, how this just it has impact on everything, everything that's going on right now. Okay, so this gives you a sense of what's happened in the space that we're in, okay, uh, since uh, 1997, okay. And of course, we started in 1977. Now, let me just talk to you a little bit about what we did when we started our business. Really, three, there are three of us. Uh, uh, that were up friends, uh, Scott Waters and Brad Sorensen and I. And, and we, we thought, what could we do in the summertime other than, you know, going and working for Logan City or, or uh, being on the USU grounds crew or, 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 or something, all of the things that we had done at one time. What could we do in the summertime that would be different, that would be stimulating? And we thought, well, let's... Let's see if we can start a business. And we had, we had a little bit of experience in Asia from LDS missions that we just served. And, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of ambition and, uh, and not a lot of smarts that would, would have stopped us. And so we started importing. We started importing. The very first thing we started were little trinkets, furniture accessories. And the way we did that... It's kind of a backwards way we did it, okay? We went to the local uh, department stores up and down the Wasatch Front, and we thought, well, the gift, you know, the gift department seems to be a space where nearly everything that's in that department is coming out of Asia. We went, and we noticed that all of them had brassware, you know, candlesticks and little tables with marble. They all had that. And we thought, my goodness, if everybody's got that, somehow we ought to be able to supply it. And so that's kind of, that was our idea. We went and we bought some samp We bought some of this stuff at retail down at the ZCMI uh, gift department. And we looked at it, and we didn't really have any contacts in Asia yet, but we said, if, if, somebody, can, if somebody can source that over there, we ought to be able to do that. Let's see if we can get somebody to buy something from us first. And one of the people we tried to go to is the, the ZCMI buyer. And, and we had the audacity to go in and, and say, we'd like to supply you this, uh, the brass ware that you've got in your department. And she said, well, I've got a supplier. And we said, well, we thought we could sell it to them a little cheaper, sell it to you a little bit cheaper than they did. And so 
you know, the samples that we showed were the stuff that we bought at retail for in her department. Okay? We said, we, we know that we can do this. Well, she didn't buy off on it. She, I think she, she could see right through us, you know. A uh, couple of university students trying to be creative. But guess what? A bunch of other people did. We went in, and what's the price? Well, gosh, is ZCMI makes 40% mark. And, and the supplier is probably making 30%, you know, then, uh, you know, we, we kind of worked into a selling price, and that summer we sold a whole bunch of stuff. And, uh, and we delivered it, uh, or we, you know, we went in and we just went off, walked into a place off the street and said, we'd like to talk to the manager, and, and we kind of had a contest between the three of us. Who could really make this happen? We made up a little price sheet, and and we found some pictures, and, and, and my goodness, people bought that from us. And at the end of the summer, we had a lot of pressure on us, right? Because we had to find somebody who would supply this. Okay? Now, our pressure wasn't that we were invested in inventory. And, you know, if, if we lost, we just lost the time that we'd spent all summer long, and we didn't make any money. Well, we, we went over to Asia, and sure enough, we went and we looked, and we found suppliers to all of that stuff. And, you know, that first summer we sold our first $15,000 worth of stuff, okay? And that grew while we were in school for a couple of years. Now, I, as we graduated from school, we had to make a decision, and the decision was, are we going to stay with this business, or are we going to, you know, go to MBA school and take a job? And, and we, had, we really had to discuss that. And uh, we decided, uh, let's just give it a year, okay, and see if we can we can do something with this. And that's what we decided in 1979, okay? That's about the time that we did our first fitness item, okay? The little mini trampoline, okay? And, and we sold, we went to our first trade show in 1980, first sporting goods trade show. We had a 10 by 10 booth. And we had, we didn't have any inventory, but we had five samples that we'd gone over to Asia and, and got these five samples and we had them hanging there and, and we made a nice brochure up. And one of the things we did, the first product that we built is we said, what can we do with this that's just a little bit different? Is there innovation that you could put into a mini trampoline? Well, let's, let's place some innovation because when, when you put innovation in something, then you're not competing on a commodity basis anymore. Yours is a little bit different. Somebody has a reason to buy it. If you have to go to the same price, get to the same price and they'll buy yours because yours is a little, little bit different, a little bit better. Okay? Somebody can always offer a lower price. I've learned that. Someone can always offer a lower price. You have to compete in differences. And many of those come innovation and intellectual property that you put into your, into your products that people can't copy. Okay? Well, we did that even with a little trampoline. You know, we, we created a, a spring system that was just a little bit different. We did this nice diagram about the, how it created a soft spot for you to jump on. And, and you know, and people said that seems like it makes sense, okay? And, and we started selling those at that trade show. We didn't have one piece in inventory, but shortage in the market, retailers wanted to buy, and, and that launched us into sporting goods. Okay? And that's where we've been into fitness, and that's where we've been ever since. We've been in that space. And we've used the same precepts from then as we added product categories. We were the first company to ever have an electronic uh, uh, device, that, a, a console on a bike that gave you speed, time, and distance electronically rather than an analog speedometer. Okay? We were the first company to uh, innovate an upper body dual action. And on and on, things that, that were just making the product just a little bit different. But that, if you went to any retailer in the world today that sells fitness equipment and asked them about Icon, what sets Icon apart to you? Guarantee the first thing they'll say is they're innovative. That's the first thing they'll say. Okay. And that's really one of the greatest precepts in not just consumer products, but anything, including anything, the College of Business, and, and what you put 
into the business school that sets you apart. Okay, how can you be creative? How can you be innovative? Sit down and think about it and figure it out and do something differently. Okay? And so, so that led to the, the industry, the growth of the industry. So today, you know, from that, that started in 1977, I'll, I'll just tell you one anecdotal story. Okay, so that summer we went and we sold all those products to all those little retailers, okay? That, that brassware. And as I told you, we kind of had a contest between the three of us. You know, one would go in and sell. Well, the end of the summer we finally get our shipments and, and we're trying to figure out what can we do to, to make these people think we're a little bit more than just three guys in a truck. And so, so we, you know, we loaded everything in, in Alma Watterson's pickup truck. And, and we go down and we had a pair of uh, coveralls, okay? And we'd take turns putting those coveralls on. <laughs> if I sold the account, then, then Scott put the coveralls on and he went and he delivered the account. If he sold it, then I had to put the coveralls on because we were the delivery, we were the delivery department. We we're the shipping department for the company, okay? And, and that, was, that was part of you know, what you do when you're starting things, right? Okay, so today, uh, you know, we've, we've grown as the industry has grown. We've been lucky. I've learned it doesn't, it, it doesn't always have to do with who's the smartest and who's the best. The smartest and the best can get caught in a macroeconomic and, and it will take them, okay? And I've learned so much of it has to do with just getting yourself positioned around those things, okay? Just getting positioned around those things. Boy, we've got, we're faced with incredible challenges every single day. Every year there's new ones. You know, right now the, the devaluation of the dollar. Here we've got a credit crisis in the United States. You know, subprime loan mess. Banks are writing loans off. Well, how does that affect us in Cash Valley? It has a huge effect on me right now because the dollar is weak all around the world, okay? And when the, when the dollar is weak, then what happens to the cost of the goods? Now, I'm, I'm trying to buy goods in, in dollars over in Asia, okay? That dollar is weak. And so yesterday it's weaker than it was the, the day before, okay? We've seen the renminbi in China go from 7.8 last year to 7.05 today, there's a 10% there's a price increase on the same good. The guy over there is selling this, making the same thing, and I'm paying 10% more for it, you know, just on currency. I mean, every day you deal with issues that are just incredible issues to deal with. But, but here we are today, and uh, about 2,800 to 3,000 employees, and and uh, doing business around the world. We have uh, grown our share uh, of the market uh, over the years, and we're about a 50% shareholder in the whole space. In the motorized treadmill category, because of our innovation and our intellectual property, we even have a stronger share of uh, the motorized treadmill business around the world. Uh, and that, that thinking, that innovative thinking, translates into intellectual property. 209 patents, 100 patent, uh, 111 patents pending. We are a global company now, and we're building uh, from a supply basis around the world. Uh, every, uh, and, and huge dynamics that are taking place with currency devaluation. You know, what you think was a good decision six months ago in terms of a sourcing supply today may not be because of raw material price changes and currency fluctuation. Very difficult uh, environment. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, data about our, our shipping and our distribution. Uh, uh, great people here. You know, we, we are, are blessed to live where we live and have the kind of people that we have access to. Many, many, many graduates of Utah State University at ICON. Many business graduates, many engineering graduates. Uh, for heaven's sakes, you go into our production environment and it's remarkable in the production environment the number of college educated people that we have that are outstanding people. 
Much of our success, we believe, lies in the human resource and the incredible people that we have that, uh, that are the associates uh, at ICON. <clears throat> Now, just to, just now, I'd like to introduce this precept for you, and I and I want you to think about it. Okay, a multiple brand strategy. Okay, the multiple channels of distribution. One of the things that we learned early is we had an appetite to grow every year. Okay, we wanted to grow and maybe grow bigger than the industry was going to let us. So, in order to do that, we had to learn how to sell something to all channels of distribution. Okay? We, we wanted to sell on the low end to Walmart. But we also wanted to sell to the sporting goods retailer, Sports Authority or Dick's. We also wanted to sell to somebody like Sears. Okay? And we also wanted to sell to the specialty fitness dealer and to the health club. Now, how do you do that? Okay? Well, the model we chose was a multiple brand model. Okay? The consumer is going to know us by our brands, not by our company name. Okay? And this is a model that you see more and more. It was a fairly innovative uh, model when we began doing this in the mid-80s. Okay? It's, it's a hard model to run. Multiple brands mean multiple SKUs. Okay? And, and what we soon learned is you couldn't just take something and have a proform name on it and sell it to Sports Authority and then take that same thing and put a Westlow name on it and sell it to Walmart. Walmart would love it. Sports Authority wouldn't tolerate it. Okay? You had to start making choices. That meant that you had to create a design and a feel for, for every brand that you put in the marketplace. Okay? That's costly. Okay? And you proliferate SKUs when you do that, right? Okay. But that was the approach that we took. And these are the brand names that are all interwoven together at ICON today. Okay. Now, there's a couple of these brands that we don't own. We don't own Reebok. And we don't own the Gold's Gym, as you might know it, the health clubs. Okay. But we, but we do own the brands in the case of Reebok, a, in a license agreement format, that brand to take into any, to take into certain channels of distribution uh, uh, for fitness equipment. A outside of that, these are other company-owned brand names. Okay, some that we've developed organically from dollar one, and some that we've acquired over the years and and, and grown them uh, after we've acquired the brand name. Okay, now think about. Can you think of any examples of companies that don't take this approach and are successful in consumer products? The one that usually comes to mind for many people is Sony. Okay? Somehow Sony has managed, uh, they started at the top, you know, in their early days Sony was selling, uh, selling audio equipment into the, the high end institutional sound studios at the high end and, and they migrated, they began migrating down. Okay. But today, you could go and you could find the Sony brand at Walmart, couldn't you? Okay. And you can find it at just about every other electronic, uh, uh, consumer electronic retailer uh, that you'd find. Okay. They've done a marvelous job at doing that. Very difficult thing to do. And there are some great brands that do it that way. And there are some great companies that do it uh, differently. Okay, this is what we found was the way that we could access all of the channels of distribution. And so we go from really the bottom to the top. Okay, which means that when you when you think of selling prices, if I were to take motorized treadmills, you go today to to Walmart and you find a motorized treadmill at $199 at retail. Okay. And so we start, we start there, and if you went into a health club, we've got some treadmills that we sell for eight or $9,000, okay? Uh, and, and so that's the approach that we've taken, okay? Free Motion is the brand that we sell to uh, health clubs. 
Proform is the brand that we sell to uh, sporting goods channels of distribution. Okay, it's a, the uh, number one fitness brand in the world. More, uh, you know, more dollars sold than any other brand in the world. Uh, Weeder is a strength brand uh, that's sold uh, in sporting goods channels. We were affiliated with that company at one time, Weeder Health and Fitness, in one of the private equity deals that we did. When, when, uh, they, when we did a, a deal with another private equity firm, the Weeders sold their share out. We maintained the uh, Weeder brand name for fitness equipment. Westlow is the brand that we started with. When we sold those first gift stores, we, were sell we had a rubber stamp, and that was the what we had on top of our letterhead. <clears throat> Image. Health Rider is a brand that we acquired. Great uh, people, Utah company. Uh, we do a lot of direct uh, to consumer business uh, through uh, the Health Rider brand. Had it for a little over 10 years. The Nordic Track brand, uh, highest brand awareness of any brands that we have. Uh, when we bought it, we weren't in a position to do everything on our own. Uh, we had to figure out how we could buy this. Uh, and, and so at the time, we engaged Sears in a deal where they uh, made some commitments to us in terms of purchasing and support and, and allowed us to, to put together a deal to buy the, the brand. And as I suggested, the Reebok is a licensed brand that we've been driving for about 10 years. Gold's Gym, really known as a strength brand. So that gives you uh, a little bit of backdrop. Uh, now let's see, we've got until 2.30? 2.20. 2.20, okay. Let's move into some precepts to ponder, all right? Now, I don't take authorship to all of these. Okay. I don't know who the author was, but I know that in all of these it wasn't me. I've, I've heard some of this that's resonated with me. Okay, so don't make, don't make Gary Stevenson source documentation on this. I wouldn't want to be uh, accused of plagiarism anywhere, okay? But there, there are precepts, nevertheless, that are observations that I have made over the years. One, never step over the gap. Do you know what that means? You, should, you accounting students know, right? Okay, don't ever let this happen to you anywhere. You know, gap is our generally accepted accounting principles, right? And, it, and they are generally accepted. And if you go beyond those, it is more than generally unacceptable. Okay? And, and don't ever, you know, what, what, we'll, we'll push and debate and argue in nearly every relationship that we have with vendors, with customers. But when it's with the accountants, that's when we stop. You know, when the auditors say this is how it should be, that's just how it should be. And one of the things that we've been able to do over the years is sleep at night because we haven't ever pushed the generally accepted account accounting principles. And, and if you go into the, 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 infamy, the infamous failures that, that we have seen the past five years in the business world, most of the time, because someone somewhere in the chain decided that they were going to step over the gap and do something that was, was pushing generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, being a yes man makes you redundant. Okay? Now, if you think about this, we all have a responsibility, I think, in the companies we work for to, to get behind a mission statement, you know, to get on board with, with the, the strategic direction of the company. Okay? And so, so it's important to support that. But it's also important when you get in that environment to think and to think differently and to be creative. And just because, you know, don't come in the office and put your finger up and say, which way is the wind blowing today? That's my direction. Okay? Be, be strong enough to be able to present an opinion if you think that an opinion should be presented. And if you're not, if you have in an organization 
people that are just going to nod their head to whatever is said at the top, then you get this redundancy that you don't need, frankly, because people aren't thinking. All right? So uh, if, if we use the term yes man, a, a yes man sometimes is just redundant in an organization because they're not value added. Okay? The, uh, corporate conscience is the sum of the conscience of the individuals in the company. Okay? The, the company becomes its own entity, but it is shaped by the conscience of the people that are there in the company that are running it. And you need to understand and you need to bring into the company the same kind of ethics that you have in your personal life. And there shouldn't be two sets. And if you find yourself working someplace where that's happening all the time, chances are you just won't be able to be there long term because it will just always be, it will always grind at you. So if you have the opportunity to be somewhere where, where you're able to place your will into the will of the company, do that. And understand it's a responsibility that you have. You, you can't step away because the company is doing something where you, whereby you say, that's not what I do. Okay. You need to express yourself and the company takes on the, the, uh, the characteristics of the people who are there. Okay. The character, the, the integrity, the hard work, the choices, the tough choices that have to be made sometimes okay, about sitting down and, and doing what's right. And sometimes when I, you, I get these issues, I don't wear a tie to work every day, but if I did, then it's when I'm looking in the mirror putting my tie on. Maybe it's when I'm brushing my pe teeth, but you look in the mirror and you say, okay, you know, is this the right thing to do? Okay, the right thing to do. Uh, no matter your scale, think gorilla, not gorilla. Now, now think about 7-Eleven selling 80% of the coffee in America, and think about Starbucks, okay, 10 years ago when they, when they decided. You know, they took a gorilla approach, a gorilla approach, okay. They didn't take the big gorilla approach, okay. Think about one of the examples I think about often is Apple Computer and IBM, okay. And Apple, I mean, I, I don't know what Apple's market cap is today. It's incredibly large. They could be termed a gorilla, but no one ever thinks of Apple as a gorilla, do they? They think of them as this gorilla warfare. And, and, and think about that. You know, I, I looked in the dictionary last night. Gorilla, here, a small independent group taking part in irregular fighting, typically against larger uh, regular forces. Okay. Well, don't get yourself into being that larger regular force. Be guerrilla-minded, you know, where you're tactical, where you can, where you can you know, go and find somebody's weakness. Uh, the guerrilla is always susceptible to being knocked off. Okay? Let others worry with you. We're going to close here in just a couple minutes. I'll tell a story. Man's laying in bed, tossing, turning, tossing, turning, tossing, turning. And his wife finally is like, I can't sleep if you're doing this. What's the problem? He says, I am stressed out. What's the matter? This note is due with the bank tomorrow, and I can't pay it. And I'm stressed about what I'm going to do when I go, have to go tell the banker I can't pay it. His wife gets out of bed, puts her coat on, leaves. It's like, what's happened? Half hour later, she comes back. What would you do? She says, you can relax now. I went and told the banker, you can't pay this, so go ahead and sleep. Okay? <laughs> well, the problem went to the banker, okay? And now he's got to worry about it. Okay? Sometimes it's okay to encircle more people with your worries than it is less. Get more people engaged in the problem that you're having. Don't wait and wait and wait, but get your constituents, your stakeholders, the people you're dealing with in the loop early on issues that you're dealing with. Okay? It always seems like in an organization that good news comes to the top just like that. And bad news, you just 
to have to work and work and work to get the bad news to extract, okay? And, and it shouldn't be that way. You, it, it should be both ways, okay? When it comes to margin, you can never be too gross, all right? And when you get in business, you'll find that gross margin is, is the key. It's right there. And if you can get a couple more top pieces on the top, that gets you a couple more pieces on the bottom. And that 2% margin on the bottom line is the battleground. To get two more percent is the difference. Okay? And it is a battleground between your customers, your suppliers, your expenses, and, and, and your financial statement. And so try starting at the top. Be as gross as you can be. Okay? All right, we're just about finished. Be a good farmer, all right? You know, if, if I asked you, all of you who have grandparents, grandfathers that were farmers to raise your hand, there'd probably be a lot of you, okay? Well, they get up early, they work hard, they practice sustainability, they rotate their crops. There's no greater example of recycling than baling wire, in my mind. Uh, they live within their means, and they always, it seems, those good farmers, their word was their bond. You know, if they said it, if they shook their hand on it, then it was, okay? And so all of you be good farmers too. Uh, that's, that's the company. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure for me to be able to be with you. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can do it. Any of you can. If, if, you're, if your approach is entrepreneurialism, you can do it. Okay, I sat in this same uh, auditorium in Econ 201. Okay, you can do it. Okay, hard work, all of these precepts, but it can happen, and I can see that it will. Thank you very much.